Welcome on behalf of Workers' Voice, La Voz de los Trabajadores, um, a new revolutionary socialist political organization uh, recently formed. This is the first in a series of monthly forums that we'll be hosting. So uh, please stay tuned for um, our upcoming events. Uh, the format of this forum will be that um, Eduardo will have time to present. Uh, sorry, Titan will be presenting an opening, then followed by Eduardo. Um, and we will have time for questions and answers. So please feel free to write your questions in the um, in the chat as we go along. Um, so today we are going to be um, talking about a case study um, of how labor organization can intersect with the issue of ecological destruction. Beginning in October 2019, Chile entered into a revolutionary process where millions took to the streets to say enough to precarious wages, healthcare pensions, privatized education, the price of public transport, among a slew of other issues. Our comrades at the International Workers Movement, MIT Chile, have been at the forefront of leading this uh, revolutionary process. Since 2019, last year, the Chilean population voted to write a new constitution. And one of our comrades at MIT Chile, Maria Rivera, was elected to the Constituent Assembly. This has given revolutionary socialists a platform to openly critique reformist and bourgeois programs. Within the Constituent Assembly, MIT Chile has led the demands to nationalize Chilean mines, proposing a program that upends the looting done by international mining companies and taking the question of extraction and ecological degradation and demanding these questions be placed into the hands of the Chilean people. Today, we'll be talking with one of the leaders of this movement, Eduardo Gallardo. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's truly um, amazing to have you speaking with us. Um, Eduardo is a mine worker uh, subcontracted at the Chuki Kamata Mines and he is the president of the Intercompany Mining Union. He has been suspended without pay for his role in the unionization fight. I also want to welcome Tayton Badger, a militant in Workers' Voice, La Voz de los Trabajadores, as well as a Nehio Marxist from the land occupied by Alberta, a land which has been devastated by the Alberta tar sands. Um, so to begin, I'm going to hand over uh, the floor now to Tayton to um, give his welcome, and then we'll be followed up by uh, Eduardo. So Tayton, go ahead. Kansakiwa. Hello, everyone. From Nihianak, Cree territory currently occupied by Canada and the province of Saskatchewan. I'd like to begin by extending Greetings and poison gratitude on behalf of Workers' Voice comrades across the land occupied by Canada and the United States to Eduardo Gallardo. Thank you for taking the time to talk about the work of the SIM, other labor unions, Indigenous activists, and socialist groups in Chile in, order, er, in their fight to nationalize mining and fight against environmental destruction. The massive upsurge of Indigenous peoples, the working class, and activists in Chile that nearly brought the Chilean government to its knees and which continues to demand widespread change despite the utmost efforts of the capitalist class, have displayed the power of the working class and oppressed groups for all to see. As both a Marxist and an activist for Indigenous rights and decolonization, I believe it is vital that we learn from struggles around the world for inspiration, as well as lessons to apply to our own context. As settler capitalist states, Canada and the United States are founded and built on extractivism and stolen land. In the early days of the European outposts and colonies that would become the United States and Confederation of Canada, these resources included fish, furs, timber, for all for markets on the other side of the Atlantic. In the United States, this was quickly supplanted by tobacco, cotton, livestock, and various grains raised on farms plantations, often produced in large part by slave labor. 
Coal, metal, and oil extraction followed. And both these and agricultural products gained through the occupation of the West fueled and continue to fuel industrialization and production in the name of profit and the ascendancy of the American capitalist class. Similarly, the Canadian invasion of the West following Confederation was a key plank of the national policy, devised in the interest of Canada's burgeoning capitalist class in the East in order to secure primary resources. These resources included agricultural goods uh, to fuel industrialization and sell overseas, as well as uh, further, the national policy served to create a captive market for industrial products. However, Agricultural products have long since been far outstripped by fossil fuels and mining as a central pillar of the Canadian economy. Fossil fuels alone count, account for 7.5% of the country's GDP and 17.5% of its exports. This is even before considering the role that uh, fossil fuel extraction plays in other sectors. Canada is also home to 75% of the world's mining companies and one of the major owners of Chilean copper mines. There's a more, of a more than a bit of truth to the joke that Canada isn't in a country so much as it is uh, three mining companies in the trench coat. From their inception, these extraction-based industries and Canadian, Canadian and American capitalism and industry as a whole is predicated on the ongoing occupation, invasion, and theft of indigenous land. This to be achieved by, elim by the eliminate, elimination, rather, one way or another of indigenous peoples. Fur trade and fisheries were built on the exploitation of indigenous Spanish animals by peoples increasingly displaced and drawn into the world economy until they in turn were re replaced and dis displaced by settler labor. The timber industry saw land stolen from indigenous peoples and traditionally managed forests exploited to provide material for European and settler industry. Settler agriculture and the consolidation of land and resources under the control of settler capitalist states was carried out at the point of a gun and through the weaponization of starvation by the mass removal and genocide of indigenous peoples. And now, fossil fuel and mineral production have joined in further displacing us by invading and destroying what land we still control. However, North American indigenous peoples have not simply rolled over and accepted, or accepted settler oppression. We have fought wars in defense of our lands, defied Indian agents and settler states, maintained our traditions, refuse to be assimilated into settler society, and continue to fight for our survival, rights, and in defense of our land and environment. Among these struggles are the ongoing fights against projects like fossil fuel pipelines, fracking, and the Alberta tar sands. The struggle of the Wet'suwet'en people, led by their hereditary chiefs and their supporters against the construction of the coastal, coastal gas link and other fracking and tar sand pipelines, through land not even theoretically ceded to the Canadian state, began over a decade ago. However, it was their call for solidarity actions following the heavily armed RCMP invasion of their land in 2020 to clear the way for pipeline workers, during which the RCMP arrested several, several dozen land defenders while detaining and assaulting dozen, dozens more, including elders and matriarchs, that would attract nationwide attention. Indigenous peoples, environmentalists, and other allies across the country launched over 25 rail blockades and countless marches and pickets. While Canada-wide support has waned, the fight against the pipeline is ongoing. Recent high profile struggles south of the border include the Stop Enbridge Pipeline 3 protests against the construction of an oil pipeline through Anishinaabe land, which threatens treaty protected land and water, including the headwaters of the Mississippi that both they and the region's planting wildlife rely on. Lease, funded directly by Enbridge by escrow account, have responded with constant surveillance, harassment, assault, raids, and the arrest of over 1,000 water protectors and allies, including 250 arrested on one day for occupying and blockading an Enbridge pump station. Despite this, Indigenous activists and supporters continue to occupy the construction route to protest against the destruction of the environment and invasion of Indigenous lands. However, I need to emphasize these are simply a few high-profile examples of current Indigenous struggles against extractivism and the attendant theft of, and destruction of our land. Farther, while they have shown the strength of Indigenous peoples and the growing number of settlers and people of color willing to fight alongside us, neither featured large-scale, rather, support from labor organizations. In fact, many major unions actively support the ongoing theft of Indigenous land in the name of job creation and kickbacks to settler labor in return for their support. This, what we, what we need more than anything, 
It's a labor unit, union, or sorry, labor movement rather, willing to fight for indigenous sovereignty and the return of our land as part of a program for a transition to just environmentally sustainable production. I can only imagine what we could, we could accomplish by uniting the indigenous struggle, and the struggle of the settler working class. The only way to begin to address the oppression faced by indigenous peoples is through decolonization, the return of the land to indigenous peoples on their terms. Decolonization is fundamentally at odds with the capitalist system, which requires constant expansion of the exploitation and of land of people, or exploitation of lands of peoples, in order to avoid stagnation and collapse. However, no longer enslaved to the drives to generate profit, it's possible for a workers' government to begin the process of decolonization. Decolonization in support of Indigenous struggles is also in the interest of settler labor. Domination of Indigenous land, as I mentioned, is core to capitalist power in the settler capitalist states. By supporting Indigenous struggles, the working class can weld together the interests of the working class and Indigenous peoples and undermine the strength of capitalism. In contrast, when the settler working class supports settler colonialism, either actively or through inaction, they serve only as a tool to strengthen capitalist domination. I believe our comrades in Chile are providing a valuable example of how we might go about welding together the interests of indigenous peoples and the largely non-indigenous working class. Further, they're providing a mass masterclass in the, use the, in the use of the transitional method, including demands core to the struggle of the Mapuche and other indigenous peoples who land, whose land is claimed by Chile. I suppose at this point, I should probably stop rambling and finally hand over the floor to Eduardo Gallardo. And thanks again for joining us.